stress, fear, depression, spiritual warfare. Are you weighted down? Do you need refreshing? Welcome, welcome everyone to the Warriors for Christ podcast, where we seek to uplift, edify, and encourage you to be light and salt in a dark and tasteless world with your host, Kyle. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Warriors for Christ podcast. I'm Kyle. And I'm Sam. And we are so glad that you're going to spend time with us today. Brother Sam, what has the Lord led you to uh, lead us through today? Kyle, today we're going to finish up the book of Ephesians. Uh, This will be the the third episode that we've done. You know, as a recap, the first episode we did all talked about God's predestined uh, plan and his foreknowledge that we would be a holy and a blameless people all through the redemption that we have in Christ. And that was discussed in the very beginning. Uh, Then after that, it it went, and again, it talked about how we used to be a people, uh, sons of disobedience, children of wrath, but we used to live that way. We don't live in that way anymore. God redeemed us. He redeemed us before the foundation of the world so that in the future, when we come to him, we would become a partaker of that salvation of hope. Uh, Then we went and talked about what it means to be in Christ or uh, really to, to know God, to be reconciled to God through Christ, which was to become part of the living stone in the temple of God, being filled with all the Spirit of God. Uh, that we're to be filled with all the same fullness of God, just as Christ was. Uh, that God now does impossible work in our lives, beyond all that we could think or imagine, according to the, the power that works inside of us. We talked about Christ, why he went, and he, he led captive captivity. He gave gifts to men. For what purpose? To, to grow the body of Christ, to equip us. Uh, until everybody comes to three things. What is the three things that you have to come to to become part of uh, the temple of God? It was the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man. Uh, The perfect man, which is the same measure and fullness that's in Christ. We covered all those in the previous episodes. Um, No longer to be that infant. The infant that is not the perfect man. The infant that does not have the spirit. The infants that's still deceived by different doctrines, by the trickery of men, by waves, uh, by wind. Uh, no longer to walk in futility, uh, in the ignorance and the futility of the mind, uh, being darkened in the understanding according to the ignorance that it, that is in us uh, because of the stubborn and rebellious heart, just like the Gentiles, uh, that these infants are no longer to be that, but they're to grow up. Uh, we talked about what it means to put off the old man and to be clothed with the new, uh, that in the likeness of God and holiness and truth, we went through and covered about all those things that we're no longer to do, no longer to walk in, our tongue, our speech, our actions, no stealing, no slander, malice, deceit, none of those things, all gone, be imitators of God, walk in love just as Christ, be that living sacrifice, no longer any filthiness, no wickedness, none of those things. Stop being deceived with empty words. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. If you're the old man still, you have no place or inheritance in the kingdom of heaven, but we're to awake to righteousness, put on light, be careful how we walk, walk in the spirit. And that pretty much brings us to where we're at now. So now we're going to finish off the book of Ephesians. Now, for everybody who just listened to that, where do you find any other gospel? Where do you find a gospel of weakness? Where do you find this progressive sanctification? Where do you, where do you find that? No. Now you see, Kyle, those are doctrines of men. That's the waves and the trickery of wind by the deceitfulness and scheming. That's why people can't come to the knowledge of the truth because they're still being deceived. They're still stuck in infancy. They can't get out of it. They can't receive the Spirit of God. That's right. So... With that, I'll open us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, be glorified in everything we say and do, O Lord. Uh, Thank you so much for the word of truth and for the spirit of truth. We thank you so much, O Lord, for this platform and the opportunity to share and to help bring people to the saving knowledge. We ask, O Lord, that you build your church, that you equip them, and that you allow them to go forth as well, O Lord. We ask this in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So today, Kyle, uh, where we're going to pick up, we're in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 22, and we're going to go to the end of the book. So we're going to talk about wives and husbands as it's related to the church, and you know, children, slaves, and then putting on the armor of God. So as it starts off, what does it say wives are to do in verse 22? Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. 
Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. That's right. So not just our wives to be subject, but also um, as the church is subject to Christ. A wife is to be subject to the husband. Now, what God really desires is the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. That's discussed in 1 Peter chapter 3. It says to wives, if wives have a disobedient husband, uh, that they are to win their husbands over without a word, without a single word, as their husbands observe their chaste and respectful behavior. And that they are to adorn themselves. We talk about a woman making a claim to godliness in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, the second half, that uh, they are not to adorn themselves with you know, gold and pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works. This is proper for a woman making a claim to godliness, a quiet and, and submissive spirit. Uh, that's what a wife is supposed to have, as the husband is the head of a wife. Now, this is the headship and authority that God has uh, established for his you know, the kingdom of heaven for those that are in that kingdom. Now, those that aren't in that kingdom and that aren't under that hierarchy or spirit, uh, they reject that. They don't follow that model. But those that do follow that model. So just as a, as a, a godly woman is going to be subject to her husband, um, we also, as the church, in the same manner, are to live that way, being subject to Christ in complete, entire submissiveness and to follow his path in the same life that he lived. As it talks about husbands, uh, what does it say with respect to husbands, starting in verse 26, or verse 25? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind, yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own body, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I am applying it to Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, and a wife should respect her husband. So a husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Uh, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, as we look at all the examples of how Christ loved the church, and even the examples of other men of God led by the Spirit of God, uh, they love by doing all things for the will of God with the purpose of leading people to redemption proclaiming the word, uh, walking as an example, uh, loving, also reproving. Christ exposes darkness. Uh, But all those things are done by the Spirit of God. That he might sanctify her, cleansing her by the washing of water with the word. Uh, Again, it's, it's, it's the word that brings us to the knowledge of the truth, that exposes all the darkness and all that is corrupt and is against the word of God, so that we can know what truth is. It's a renewal by the Holy Spirit. You know, I think of right Titus chapter 3, where it talks about, you know, the the kindness of God has saved us, Uh, not according to our righteousness, but according to his mercy. And it's by the bath of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. Uh, The word of God brings a truth. It, It removes, it washes away the lies and the deception, and it allows the Spirit to then come in and be renewed by the Spirit of God inside of us, in our mind, our heart, our conscience, depending on where we're reading in the Bible. And the whole point is that we then are being presented. We're presented in glory. Having how many spots? None. How, having how many wrinkles? None. None. But that we're what type of a people? A holy people without blemish. A holy and blameless people. This gets back to the very beginning of Ephesians chapter 1 that we talked about. God's predestined plan that we be a holy and blameless people. We, when we put on the likeness of God, we walk in holiness and righteousness of the truth. We don't have those other things. They've been removed. They put to, they've been put to death. God tells us, remain in the sanctification with which I put you in. Amen. So husbands are to lo- love their wives uh, as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. 
No one hated his own flesh, but nurses it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. And so we, we do all things for the purpose of God, living and following the example of Christ. Now, with respect to the great mystery, as it says, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The whole, the greater mystery, the greater purpose is that we are to be joined to Christ. We are to become one with Christ. Not just one with Christ, but one with all the saints. Not just one with all the saints, but one with the Father. One with the Father, one with the Son, one with all the saints. And the unity of the faith through the one spirit, the one baptism. We covered about earlier. That's what it's all about. That's what it's supposed to be. That is what God calls us. And he, he uses the, the marriage as a similar example. So then he goes on, he talks about children. Children are, are, obey their parents, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment of a promise, that it may be well with you, that you may live long on the earth. Uh, are fathers to provoke their children? No, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. All we can do as fathers is we can live our life, a godly life, proclaiming truth, instructing, disciplining. But we are not to be hypocrites. You see, too many people are hypocrites. That's the problem. Uh, they don't have the true love of God in their life, and they live a life of hypocrisy that causes a, rebel a rebellion in their children. When you live a godly life without hypocrisy, you will be able to discipline your children, You'll be able to show love and kindness to your children, and you're going to bring them up in the Lord. Now, when they get to a certain age and they go off on their own, they then have to make their own choice. But as you raise a child, a child is not to be rebelling against you when they're under your house. If there is rebellion, there's something wrong that shouldn't be happening under the household of a man of God. Slaves are to be obedient to their own masters uh, with fear and trembling, with sincerity of the heart according to Christ. And they're to, to live their life. And not, not only is it when it talks about slaves or servants here, but really this applies to us too. They're to live their life in what manner in verse 6 and 7? Not only while being watched and in order to please them, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not to just men and women, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. Right, so as, as we look at this, it, it all comes down to just as slaves of Christ, and Christ did the will of his Father, the will of God. We also are to do it, and it all gets back to the heart. If you don't have a new heart, you can't do the will of God. You, you can't do the will of God. You, you have to have a new heart. God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at outward obedience. He looks at inward obedience. So following the same example of Christ, Christ did the will of the Father from the heart, so also are we. The first thing you have to do is get a new heart. And we do all things as unto the Lord, not as pleasing men. That's how we're to live. Now, moving on, I want to look at the armor of God. Here we have some imperative commands. Uh, with respect to the armor of God. In verse 10, it tells us that we're to be something. What are we to be? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. It's a command. So be strong in the Lord and the strength of his power. And when it talks about the Lord here, it's referring to, again, the Father. I, I know that just from context, and, and you can get that a lot. Because, again, in the Old Testament, when they talk and they spoke and they wrote, we, we had the proper name of God. So we knew specifically when they were speaking about the Father, when you go to the New Testament, everybody becomes uh, Lord, just curios, master. So to know which one, it all comes down to context. So if you look carefully at the words, it's, it's pretty clear as you look at it. And this is the same with, with many of the books in the New Testament. You can tell which one is which. And it makes it really easy when they quote the Old Testament. Uh, but it's the strength of the Lord. Therefore, you're to put on whose armor? The whole armor of God. The armor of God. It's the armor of God. It's the same armor that Christ had. So let's look at some of this. So one of the purposes, you put on the armor of God so that what? So purpose? that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So we stand firm against the tricks, the schemes, the wiles of the devil. Does it say so that we fail? 
nope. so we don't over stand God. firm. So we stand firm. And this is consistent with, throughout Scripture when it talks about proof of a faith, overcoming the temptations and trials. No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, God will provide you a way out so that you stand up under it, firm. So we overcome. We don't fail. Amen. This is what God promises for us. So we stand firm against these schemes. Because somebody who's in Christ, somebody who has the Spirit of God who's been born again, it's his struggle now. You know, previously it talked about our struggle used to be against ourselves, against the flesh, the heart, the sin nature that lived within us. We would battle and war against the corruptions that live within us. Is that the corruption and the battle and the war that we now wage? No. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's right. That's the battle that we now fight. Now, until somebody is born again of the Spirit, their war is inside of them. Their war is against their own heart or the sin that dwells within them that they cannot overcome. Because they're still a son of disobedience. Because that's right. They're still a son of disobedience. They're still a sinner. They haven't been changed. That old man hasn't been put to death. It hasn't been removed out of their heart. Once it's removed out of their heart, now we go into the world and we war against the forces of darkness. And now God says, don't let any of that get back inside of you. Keep it on the outside. You do that by continuing to seek and follow Christ each day, setting your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and not go and setting your things on the world, but on those things that are eternal and invisible in the heavens and the hope uh, that is laid before us that we run our race. So this is the war that we're supposed to fight, grounded in the armor of God. So now he gives us a command. How much of the armor are we commanded to have? The whole armor of God. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having every, done everything to stand firm. So again, the command is that we're to stand firm, not to fail, but to overcome. Why? Because we have put on the whole armor of God. So again, in verse 14, he commands us to what? Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's right. Stand firm, having girded ourselves with a belt of truth. See, everything starts with the truth. You have to have the truth. Amen. When you have the truth, the truth leads to a new heart and it leads to righteousness. We, came, we become a slave of righteousness. You know, we talk about that, living our life as a holy and blameless, righteous life. We walk in the same example as Christ walked. We produce the fruit of righteousness. We're to be righteous just as Christ is right, righteous. It's, it's a life. That righteousness is what we go out and we live. That righteousness is a breastplate. It, it, it goes back to those who fall away from the faith, those who don't endure, those who go back to old things. You lose your breastplate. You see, the breastplate, it's, it's a penetrant. It protects. You come into the truth through the word of God. You have the breastplate, which is the proof and the evidence of your faith. It's impenetrable. It protects you. Verse 15. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. That's right. Our feet are to be prepared to go out and proclaim God's truth. We aren't to have feet that are unprepared. We're to have feet that are prepared. We're always be, to be ready to give an account of the hope that is in us. Always being ready to give an account of the hope that is within us, Peter tells us. We're to proclaim the truth. It compels us. The love of God compels us. We can't keep it in. Our feet are prepared. We go out. We proclaim the truth. This is the soldier of Christ. You're girded in truth. That's why you receive the new heart. You, you have the breastplate of righteousness because you live a life of righteousness. It's the proof and evidence of the true faith and the truth that you're girded on. Your feet are prepared, going about proclaiming the truth as God continues to give you opportunity. Verse 16. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And you look at the shield of faith. You see, the devil is going to continue to attack, attack, and attack. The devil continues to try to undermine the word of God. Undermine and tear it down everywhere, every little place he can. There are so many aspects of truth in the word of God the devil is trying to tear down. 
That's why we have to continue to be in the word. We have to continue to be reminding and renewing our mind, renewing of the mind of the truth that is in it, because the, the deceits of the devil in the world are continuing to try to erode and, and, and circumvent the word and the truth of God in all the aspects of this wicked world. So we have to continue to be renewed and reminded of the things that we had at first so that we don't forget. And we're to take captive all these thoughts raised up against the knowledge of God. Which I want, I want to turn to and I want to read that. In 2 Corinthians, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I'll just read that real quick. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in the beginning, uh, it talks about how we walk and how we war. In chapter 10, verse 3, who does it say we, we um, war against? Indeed, we live as human beings, but we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. We are ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Yeah, so here, Paul, Paul, you know, there were a lot of problems in the Corinthian church, and, and Paul was saying that they were being arrogant. Uh, some of them were claiming to be of Christ. He says, like, nope, you have a vain faith. Uh, many of them had no knowledge of God. So there's a lot of rebuke there, um, you know, in Corinthians. And one of the things he's pointing out is like, listen, our warfare is supposed to be spiritual warfare. Our warfare is supposed to be divinely powerful of the Spirit of God that is in us that we read about earlier in the previous episode in Ephesians. We're to be destroying all these things raised up against the knowledge of God, all these vain and futile speculations, these waves and winds of doctrine and trickery of men, all these lies. We're to take these things captive and destroy them. All the things raised up against the knowledge of God, destroy them. The problem is with the Corinthians, they couldn't even do that because they were still being disobedient. And they're still trying to bring them into obedience because there are so many problems with the Corinthian church. Now, we talked about sons of disobedience, wrath of God. Sons of disobedience don't inherit the kingdom of heaven. But yet people like to identify themselves with a son of disobedience because they say, oh, yeah, my life looks like that still. But, oh, thank goodness we're all still sons of God and we all have the eternal promises. No, that's a deception. That's a lie. I'm going to take captive that, that thought and I'm going to destroy it. That's a lie. That's not of God. The devil's trying to deceive you so you can't fulfill the promise of God. Don't listen to it. Turn to your Bible and turn to God. Appeal to him. Let him rescue you from that pit of, pit of hell and a lie. So this is important. Kyle, this is the war that we fight. This is the war that we fight. You know, before I spent many of my time warring against myself, trying to overcome sin. At the same time, trying to encourage others in their walk with Christ. Not even knowing the warfare that God wanted me to fight. Well, one, you have to overcome the, the, the sin inside of us. That's, that's number one, putting to death the old man. Then you live, and now, now you war against all the deception and the corruption in the church, which, which is where the devil wages most of his warfare. Amen. Against the church, inside the church, with deceitful doctrines of men corrupting the true and the power of God. Holding to a form of godliness, but denying its power. Tell you, Kyle, this is the warfare that we fight. Amen. Taking up the helmet of salvation. What does it say in verse 17? Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The helmet of salvation. Now, I like the, the helmet of salvation. One of the things I like about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it makes reference to the, uh, the helmet of salvation. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, um, it talks about, the helmet, which is the hope of salvation. The helmet, which is the hope of salvation. And, you know, as we look at that, we have the helmet, the helmet on our head to protect our head. What we are reminded of is we have a hope of salvation. We read this many, many places throughout. Uh, the Gospels talk about it. Paul talks about it. Peter talks about it. John talks about it. We have a hope. We have a hope in heaven reserved, a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This hope that we, that we look forward to, a hope eternal, this is the hope that we continue to strive. That's why we continue to strive for, that we lay hold of the hope um, and run our race. It is a hope of salvation. It's the helmet on our head that we continue to protect and strive for, not forgetting, so that we don't turn away from the race, that we continue it firm until the end, not wavering. Amen. 
then we have a sword. What does it say in verse 17 about this sword? And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And, you know, a lot of people, it, it makes good reference. We go to Hebrews, um, where it talks about the sword of the Spirit, or the sword, the Word of God. I think it's Hebrews chapter 6. Or is it 4? I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, what does it say in Hebrews chapter 4? Actually, I'll, I'll start in uh, verse 11 because it gives another warning. But verse 11 through verse 12, what does it say in Hebrews chapter 4, 11 through 12? Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through such disobedience as theirs. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Amen. Uh, you know, the one, the warning, it gets back to disobedience. We, we have to bring people into obedience to the true knowledge of Christ, the true faith, the true power of God. Uh, so many people are still sl- sons of disobedience, and, and they haven't come into obedience. Uh, the warning, some people fall back into disobedience and, and exclude themselves and fall out of the promise of God and are destroyed and don't enter into God's rest. That's the whole book of Hebrews that talks about that, that we covered in the episodes. Um of we must listen to Christ, you know, Hebrews chapter 1 through 4. But here, the Word of God, it divides. You see, it divides down to soul and spirit. The thoughts and intentions of the heart, it gets back to the heart. It's going to expose whether we're that not, whether we're of God or we're not of God. It's going to expose the lies. It's, it's what we use with the Word of God to, to go and, and tear down these fortresses and these strongholds, these lies. When I speak against people who proclaim falsehood, I use the Word of God. The Word of God, you cannot refute it. There are so many different deceits. You know, the one of the ones recent we talked about, people say Jesus doesn't have a God. Well, that's not what the Word of God says. It says he does. We go through where he explains it and how he talks about the relationship. You see, you can't argue against that. People don't want to accept it, not because of that's what the Word of God says. They don't want to accept these type of truths because it doesn't line up with what they've been taught. Uh, people are told that they're, they're a child because they said a prayer that they're a child of God now. I'm sorry, if you keep reading the Word of God, it confronts and exposes that many of these people are not sons of God. They're, they're still sons of the devil, living in deception. Uh, and you cannot refute the Word of God. The Word of God exposes the lie. It's going to divide all the way down to heart. Now, people, typically, they get angry. Well, if they would just humble themselves and accept the Word of God, it would divide down to the heart and soul and, divide, and expose the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And it would, it would give people the knowledge that leads to truth so that they could be uh, uh, saved from the slavery to sin and become a partaker of the hope of salvation. And so we use the Word of God. When the Word of God is used and accurately handled, it is a sword that is wielded that cannot be stopped. It is a sword that destroys and tears, tears down and defeats the enemy. It sets people free. But it has to be in truth. The Word of God accurately handled but a sword not accurately handled? People think they're using it for good, but yet they don't even realize the, sword, the very sword they're using, they're using it to destroy other people's lives, including their own. They aren't accurately handling and wielding the sword. And to their doom, they're going to destroy themselves if they don't humble themselves. Back to Ephesians. We're to continue to pray, pray at all times. How and why does it claim to be praying in verse 18 to 20 of Ephesians chapter 6? Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. Amen. We're to always be in praying, praying at all times. We're to be walking and being led by the Spirit at all times, producing spiritual fruit, not fruits of darkness or fruits of this world. When we're being led by the Spirit and praying in the Spirit, we pray for the things of God. We pray as God leads us. We pray for His will to be done. Now, interesting enough, Paul asked for prayer that something would be given to him. A message. A message may be given 
to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Now, some people might find that surprising. You know, Paul's been writing these letters. He, he's been proclaiming the truth. It's like, why does he need to ask for prayer to make known the mystery of the gospel if he already knows it? Because God knows what people need to hear. God knows what truths need to be spoken or what strongholds need to be torn down. That's why we always go and we ask God to give us the wisdom to accurately handle, to speak the things, so that his spirit can work in the hearts and minds of the people that God has targeted as his audience that he wants to reach. And so that's why we always appeal to God. We don't assume that we know what God wants to be said. We, we appeal to him in humility in all things of the spirit for him to lead us in all things. So then he goes and he closes. At the end, he gives a, a, a closing statement in verse 23. He says, Peace to the brethren and faith with love from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. They're two different people. They're two different people. One's God. One's our Lord and Master. One is the ultimate authority to whom we are trying to reach and be reconciled to. The other is the access by whom that God made it possible, and the example that we're to follow in. Father, I thank you. I pray, O oh God, that his people listen to your word, that they'll come to experience the love of Christ. The love of Christ, which actually isn't the love of Christ, but the love of God, the love of God that was in Christ. The same love of Christ that's to be in us, but also it's actually the love of God that you put in Christ and you put in us. That just as you, O oh God, are loving the world, so also we are commanded to be the same love. Father, I pray that people will love with an incorruptible love, the love of God. We know that we can only get that from you, O oh God. Father, I pray that you lead people to be able to put on the full armor of God. Father, that people will start fighting the warfare that you want them to fight. No longer fighting this war of lust of the flesh and of the heart because they're still corrupted and they haven't been freed. But so that man can be put to death by the Spirit of God by being born again and being baptized, spiritual baptized into Christ. So that they, they can now put on the full armor of God, receive of the new heart, all the fullness of God by the Spirit of God. So that they can now fight the warfare against the strongholds of darkness. Going out and being faithful laborers in the fields of harvest to add more living stones into the temple. Father, I thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We hope this weekly program helped rekindle your zeal to know, love, and serve Christ day by day. If you enjoyed the program, consider subscribing and sharing with your friends. Thanks for listening.